Okay, so we're back for the second session of linear regression. So in the first session, we looked at the concepts, basic concepts of linear regression. We really didn't go into any great depth. We just introduced the notion that what we are trying to do in linear regression is to find the best line. We didn't even talk about how exactly to get the best line. We left that to statistical packages. I'm hoping that the hands-on activity that you performed must have helped you to understand the concept a little bit uh, more clearly than it was possible during the lecture. So now I think we are in a position to take this uh, concept further to understand this a little more deeply. Just to recap, in the last exercise, in the hands-on exercise, we had a file in which we had the SAT scores, average SAT scores of some school districts. And we had some information about the various school districts. And for every school district, one of the variables we had available to us was the expense that, you know, the amount of money that the school district was spending for primary and uh, secondary education within the school district. And what we found is that there is a sort of a negative relationship between expense and uh, the median or average SAT score in the school district, which we would not have expected, but that's where it is. And by looking at the scatter point, scatter plot, we see that this negative trend is not very strong because there are lots of points which are far away from the regression line. But we see that there is a general trend in this negative direction. Okay, so we performed a linear regression. We identified the linear regression model. We also looked at the uh, a measure of the deviation of the points from the model. So we looked at all of these things. We learned how to actually build this chart to do the scatter plot and also to put in the least squares line on this scatter plot. We did all of this in the last hands-on activity. Now what I want to do is to take this a little bit further and talk about a quantitative measure of the quality of our regression and talk about all of these various errors that we are seeing on this scatter plot. We need to get a handle on that to con condense all of that into a few numbers that we can look at and examine. And then we want to ex extend this idea to multiple linear regression. By multiple linear regression is what we are saying is we want to include other variables also into the picture. Here we have predicted the SAT scores based on just one single variable, which we of course know from the outset is very unrealistic because the SAT score of a school district is affected by so many different variables, right? But for introduction, we just used one variable. In this exercise or in this lecture, we look at multiple linear regression and the hands-on activity will go much, uh, much deeper into the concepts. Okay, so this is just a recap. This is the model that we looked at in the last lecture. We've got a uh, number of rooms and the prices of the homes. And we plotted this least squares line connecting the two things. And we also saw that uh, once you plot a least squares line, you've got the errors between the, that is the distance between the actual points, uh, between the actual values and the predicted values. The predicted values are the values on the line. And the actual values are by the way they fall. There is a difference and the difference is an indication of the distance. It is called the residual in uh, regression. Okay, so uh, looking at the regression output from the last time. Uh, so we see this regression equation and what it's telling us, this is really the regression coefficients. The beta, beta zero is this 34.671, beta one is 9.102 and you multiply that by the number of rooms and you get the price or the median value of the homes. I'm just, median value is the name of that variable within the file, I just call it price for discussion, okay? So let's say, you uh, let's try to understand some additional concepts here. Let's say you've got data about lots of houses and we know that the average household value is 250,000. That's the average value of a home in a, you know, in a, in a particular neighborhood, let's say, or in the whole country, 250,000. So now I ask you, what is your best prediction for the value of a random household? Right, so I give you this house. I say, okay, we're walking along the street, I point a house to you. Uh, of course, I, I don't tell you anything else about the house and you can't see the house. I'm just saying I'm pointing at a particular house. What's the value of that house? Okay, now given no other information, where is this house? Which neighborhood is it? How big is it? 
how old is it uh, etc etc we don't know any of those things in which state is it is it in new york city is it in uh, uh, you know somewhere deep in the midwest in the middle of the prairie we don't know about all of that we just given the house well then all you can really say is my best guess is 250000 there's no other information that is given to me this we've already spoken about in the absence of information we can only go with uh, uh, with the average okay so in the absence of any information so average is this particular line that you're seeing here this is the average okay and i i just pointed to a house and said what is the price and you said well the price is just the average price but in reality the price of that house is here okay which is this that's the price and therefore the deviation is so much is the distance between the actual point and the line that is the difference between the actual price and the predicted price predicted price in the sense you predicted the, av the average right so that is your prediction this is reality so that's the deviation between the two okay so that is in the absence of any information we didn't give you information about rooms and so on okay so without the regression results our best prediction would be the known average and the error would be yi which is the real value minus y bar which is the average y bar is the notation that is used for average okay but now here is our regression line we have now fitted the regression we had fitted the regression line earlier i'm not showing all the other points we're looking at only one point but based on all the other points we have fitted the regression line and now what is our error it's only so much it's a little bit better than before earlier the error was the difference between this point and the average but now the error is the difference between this point and the regression line right so the regression line allowed us to reduce the error from yi minus y bar that is the actual value minus the mean that was the original error we have now brought it down to the actual price minus what the model predicts which is the line which is the regression line this is what the model predicts right so we were able to reduce the error from this to to this now uh, notice here that i'm using the symbol y hat and that is used for the model's prediction, regression model's prediction. So we reduce the error from yi minus y bar, that is actual minus the mean, to actual minus the model prediction. Okay, so that's the improvement that the reduction, uh, the regression has given us, right? So the uh, improvement is y, y hat minus y bar that is this distance the distance uh, between between the regression line and the mean okay so the regression even though it may not be doing a lot it may not be helping us to get a very accurate prediction it is useful to the extent that it helps us to make a better prediction than otherwise pre what we would have predicted which is the mean okay that's what we have looked at that is the lift we are getting from the regression the regression is helping us to make a better prediction than simply stating the average. And whatever help it gives us there, that's what is going to be uh, of use to us. So even small improvements there can be financially beneficial, can make a lot of difference, right? So we shouldn't be misled by the fact that a lot of points are very far away from the regression. It's still okay. You, you might get a 10% improvement than earlier and that 10 percent could be very very significant that's really the way to look at all of these techniques okay so again this is the earlier diagram we we are seeing the uh, reduction in error from this to this so we can say that this part of the line is the portion of the deviation which is explained by the regression Right. In other words, in the absence of regression, our whole deviation was the difference, the distance from here to here. That was this. Right. So you may originally say, well, there are all these homes. I don't understand why the price of all these homes is varying because I've not given you any other information. 
You say one home is worth 250,000, another home is worth 200,000, the third home is worth 100,000, the fourth home is worth 500,000. Well, why are these things different? Why are they not all the same? Right? In the absence of any other information, you can't say anything. But I'm able to say, you know what, that home has 10 rooms. Oh, it has 10 rooms. No wonder it costs 500,000. This home has only one room. Oh, no wonder it costs 50,000. Okay, so now you're able to say that the independent variable number of rooms is explaining the price variations. That's what we mean by regression is explaining the variation in the dependent variable. Okay, that's really what we're saying. So the portion of the deviation that the regression is able to explain is this much. Right. So we know now why this particular home is lower. The price of this particular home is lower than the average. It's lower than the average because its number of rooms is probably pretty small. OK, if it had more rooms, its price would have been higher than the average. It has a low number of rooms, so its price is lower than the average. But its price is significantly lower than the average. Your regression is not able to explain why it's so low. It's able to explain a little bit. OK, so this is what we mean by saying regression is explaining a portion of the total deviation. OK, so that is the extent to which regression is helping us. So it's not 100% accurate, but still helping us somewhat. OK, and this part is what is called the unexplained portion of the deviation. We loosely refer to it as error, but purists would say that's not the error. That is simply the residual. That is, what is, what part of the error remains unexplained? What part of the variation remains unexplained? They call that as the residual. Okay, so that's the idea here. So now there are several things we've talked about. So if you've got a bunch of points, as we've spoke about earlier, for every point, there is a variation, right? So if you look at the total set of points, not all of them have the same price. Every house has a different price. Probably, of course, some of them may have the same price, but there's a lot of variability. So you have this notion of the total variability within the set of data we have, which is the, the variance. Okay, not really the variance, but the total variability. Okay, that is the sum of squares of all the points deviations from the average. That's the total variation and that in regression terms is referred to as the total sum of squares. But notice that you're taking the deviations from the average. Right. So at this point, you've not fitted any model, nothing. You just have all the points and you're saying, oh, this is the amount of variation there is across the points from the mean. OK, so now we are able to say uh, variation which is accounted for by the regression or by the independent variable. And that is what is called sum of squares regression, which is the difference from uh, the, you know, by the predicted value from the mean. That's what we saw. The distance between the predicted value and the mean is what we are able to say is explained by the regression. Right. So let's just quickly scoot back to the previous slide. That is this part. This is the part which is the difference between the predicted value and the average. This is the part that the regression is able to explain. That's what we are looking at. And that is what is called as the sum of squares regression, SSR. And finally, there is the unaccounted portion of the variation, which is the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. And that is what is called sum of squared errors or SSE. OK, so these are three terms that are used in, in regression for discussing the variability in, in the dependent variable. And of course, you know, from the from the diagram itself, you can figure out the TSS is nothing but the sum of SSR and SSE. Right. So this is the total variability. This is the variability that regression explains. This is the variability that the regression is unable to explain. So you add up these two, you'll get that. That's the total variability. And if you take a look at the proportion of variation explained by the regression, which is sum of squared regression divided by total sum of squares, that is what people refer to as the R square 
coefficient r square of the regression that's the measure of what proportion of total variation the regression explains right so tss is all of this variability in the data that is we are saying we've got a bunch of homes and the prices are all over the place well the prices are all over the place because all these homes have different numbers of rooms and therefore prices vary and that's what that is the explanation that regression provides but of course regression is not able to explain all of the differences you know there are some homes which have lots of rooms but the price is still low there are some homes which have very few rooms price is still high the regression is unable to explain that right so that's the unexplained portion of the regression so this figure ssr divided by tss is what is called the coefficient of determination or it's called as r square in the case of simple linear regression r square is simply the correlation coefficient but in the case of multiple linear regression this is referred to as the coefficient of determination or multiple r square that's a good measure of how good the regression really is okay so this is really the point okay so now we've got the sum of squared errors okay that is the difference between the actual value and what the model predicts okay the residuals so we've taken each residual for each point we have taken the actual value minus the or the, the the actual value minus the predicted value we have squared it we squared it because we want to get rid of the negative sign if any we add it all up okay that's a measure of the total amount of unexplained error that is still sitting out there okay but this is the total it's a total taken across n different points so now we may say if we divide it by n we should get an estimate of the squared error per point right let's say we've got 200 households for every household we took the difference between its price and the actual price uh, between its price and the predicted price by the model squared it and added it all up right so we've got the total error across 200 households we want to get an idea of what is the error per household okay the squared error per household is of course going to be this total value divided by n which is the number of households okay but of course this is still the squared error okay squared error per item so to get an idea of what the actual error is we take the square root of that okay so we take the square root of that which is the sum of squared errors divided by n which is the squared error per item take the square root of that and that gives us an idea of what is the error per item without any squares and all that we squared initially to get rid of the sign now that we've got rid of the sign, we're bringing it down back to one value, okay? So this value is what is called as the root mean square error, okay? That is, we took the mean squared errors and took the square root of it. So it's called the root mean squared error, okay? So RMS is a good measure of the performance 